Welcome to the Flamin Connect podcast, a podcast focused on the individual pieces that make up the larger community of people together doing what's right and making a difference. Today's hosts, we have myself, Trevor Grindy, Regan Kuntz, and Mitch Flamin. What vegetable is best with cheese? Hmm. A pepperoni stick? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't believe I eat any vegetables with cheese. I, I oh, no, the no. closest you're I would get no, to would be like think, celery and cheese whiz. No, that's what you're thinking. But what about like uh, shredded cheese on oh. a baked potato? Okay. Or yep. what about baked potato? It's not a vegetable. Yeah, it's a starch. Well, no potato. Sure, but. But it is, is classified as a vegetable, is it not? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Well, yeah. now, I know he stumped the, me there. In the man this is, menu, this it is. This is Tricky no. Trevor oh, here. There's something behind tra- this. <laughs> like in the garden where I get the potato from is full of vegetables mm-hmm. and some fruits, mm-hmm. not starches. Yeah. Okay. That's that's where my train of thought's <laughs> going. <laughs> anyway, okay. okay. So potatoes Pass. is up there. Well, we so decided. so let's say that one doesn't count. Then what else? Uh, you know, we we'll make I guess broccoli with a little bit of cheese no, on it and stuff like that's that. That's what I was right? thinking. Um, cauliflower with okay, here we go again. I don't know why it, what it's with, with cheese whiz. Not that we eat a lot of cheese whiz in our house. <laughs> Not like that's real cheese. Uh, but <laughs> you know, if you take cauliflower and you steam it or whatever, cook it and put a little cheese whiz on it, add some cheese sauce. It's pretty damn good. I feel like we're missing mm. we're missing one here. It's got to be. It's got to yeah. be one that like sticks right out. What we started doing is you take the whole head of cauliflower, like you don't chop it up, the whole thing, and you put it into a pot and with a bit of water, you cover it, yeah. and it kind of steams in there, and you put cheese on it like that. It's oh, yeah. so good. Mm-hmm. Like in the this, the whole head. The whole head, yeah. Oh, really? yep. So do you do you cover it with water, or you just put a little bit of water? Just a little bit in the water. And steam it. It. Yep. That's a, yeah, I've never had it that way. Quinoa, quinoa counts as a vegetable. It's got to. Well, it's a cereal. <laughs> quinoa is a grain, isn't it? Cereal grain, sure it is. Yeah, but that's not a vegetable. Well, it's a grain. Ah, <laughs> uh, this shouldn't be so hard. I know. You know, like, I, is what there are, an answer to this? Are, are you just, smarter? There's than no a, answer. Are you smarter than a fifth grader like that? Yeah, I guarantee I these kids right now in science class would just come and pump our eyes shut. Like, are you mm. stupid, Dad? Like, are you? Are you? Uh, <laughs> okay, like, are you so kidding me if right there's now? a slice of cheese between the lettuce and the tomato on your burger, does that count? Well, I'm thinking I'm it's sure. gotta. Yeah, yeah, it's gotta. It's gotta. So then lettuce. <laughs> and like when you make uh, well, when like you a make cob a cob salad or yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah now there you we're go. talking. Yeah. yeah. Um. Oh, I like me a Greek salad. Oh, so that's yeah, got feta too. cheese in it. Oh, yeah. yeah. See, there oh, you go. There that go. that yeah. actually might be the answer. Taco salad. That might be the. I'm surprised yeah. how long it took us to get there. Yeah, I, you know. I knew like tricky, tri- <laughs> tricky. <laughs> Trevor's not. trying to throw you in the. No. Yeah. So let's go into. Did you know what food product from Western Canada was pulled from store shelves in Britain with the explanation that it was a novel food that hadn't been proven safe to eat? <laughs> let's hear the options, Trevor. No options. What? No options. You're, okay. Can I get a year? Uh, no. Those Brits, eh? Those, Those Brits. Brits. <laughs> Picky Brits. You, you people, eh? You yeah. people. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so say it again. So a product that was pulled in the shelves from Britain that came from Western Canada that was proved unsafe. Or not proved. It it wasn't proved safe. safe. Can you get yeah, us, it was give us a novel. Hint? Are we talking like animal protein? Are we talking like nope. crop? Uh, crop. Reggie, prairie oysters. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's both categories. Yeah, that's, that covers it all. Um, um, you know what? I'm just going to take a wild ass guess here and say potentially it was canola oil back in the day. Oh, that's a good guess. Uh, can you tell me if it's animal or plant based? Plant. Okay. Okay. Hmm. Hmm. Every every option I had was animal based. So, no, I got nothing. Let's hear it. It's something that you're very familiar with. Really? Yeah. Okay. Oatmeal. 
Saskatoon berries. Ah, Interesting. Yeah. So Britain's Food uh, Standard Agency gave the order, arguing that it was a rare food and it had to be reviewed. So the decision jeopardized exports of Saskatoons to other European uh, countries as well. Uh, the ups, that upset the Saskatchewan Minister of Agriculture, who pointed out that the royal family regularly eats Saskatoons on visits to Canada and even suggested that we take a lesson from the Boston Tea Party and dump English breakfast tea <laughs> into, the, <laughs> Kid for tea. Into, into the Wiscana Lake. Yeah. Uh, the transatlantic food fight eventually fizzled out when more practical Germans indicated the acceptance of Saskatoons, clearing the way for the eventual shipments to other parts of Europe. I love Saskatoons, actually. Yeah, There's a certain awesome. time of the year, oh, yeah. especially around here. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Saskatoon berry pie. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. I just yeah. I love them just right off the yep. tree. And down we the we have bags in the freezer, and I throw them in the smoothies in the morning. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm a little biased, though, towards Saskatoon berries. Like, growing up, we had, like, uh, you pick oh, yeah. Saskatoon berry farm. And so, like, having an income as a kid was cool, like, at two bucks an hour. But that's what I did was weeded Saskatoon trees my whole like childhood so it even got to the point where like people would because you ate them you you snacked on them the whole all day long and then when people would bring you well they bring dad these pies as like a thank you for letting me come pick berries i just i was just so jaded i looked at those pies and like that's it like that's what <laughs> that's what all this work was for was just that pie. Yeah. like i'm over it <laughs> yeah I like to take the uh, canned Saskatoons and pour them on ice cream, mix yes. them in. Yes, oh, yeah. That's yes, good. yeah, oh. yeah. Good call. Did you guys have? Do you eat choke cherries? Uh, you used to sometimes. As a kid. Yeah, I just that, that's another memory I have of Grandma always making choke cherry syrup and having that on pancakes. Yeah, yeah. syrup or just, jam is good. Like she called them June berries too. Maybe it's the same thing. I don't know. I don't know. But they're not Choke ripe. You they're can't not eat them. Till August, though. Well, yeah, and then you got to pit them, and you had, like there's a process there, but it's it's super tasty once you pour a pile of sugar <laughs> into sugar, it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> all, all of it is the same ingredient <laughs> yeah. that makes it stand out. Sugar. Lots of sugar. Maximum sugar. <laughs> okay. What am I? Okay. So in <laughs> the 1930s, there were over 3,200 of them in Saskatchewan. By 1999, there were only 304. The oldest one is in Fleming, which was built in 1895. What is a grain elevator? What a good guess. Correct. <clears throat> ah, what yeah. a good guess. Good guess. Uh, that's interesting, the Fleming one, though. Yeah. Hmm. How tough do you feel right now? Oh, I'm, I'm 10 feet tall. I'm pulling pin now. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm done. <laughs> Drop, mic drop. Okay, it's time for Now You Know. It's uh, where we talk to people, experts in the ag industry. Uh, Today we're talking with David Fielding with Top Crop. And uh, today we're going to be talking about solubility. So first of all, let's start with what is solubility? Solubility is a measure. The quasi-scientific definition would be how well something dissolves in water, how readily something dissolves in water. And it's useful to know right off the bat that there are just some things that don't, right? You're, you're, you're taking a look at a rock, you're taking a look at a complex mineral, it's, it's just not going to dissolve in water or there's gonna need to be other processes that take place in order to be able to carve off the nutrients that are contained within it. You see a lot of mineral additions in organic farms, small scale farming, um, that when you try to bring over into the commercial ag world, just don't work. And, and, and that would be one of the primary differ- differentiating factors is that you move from mineral nutrition over a longer period of time to more salt based nutrition that's available in year one. So are there um, factors that producers or people in their garden or whatever uh, can contribute to their soil to increase or reduce the solubility? As far as increasing or decreasing solubility, that, that's more of a product-based characteristic. So different salts have different solubilities. For example, uh, 40% of MAP, which is a, a commonly used fertilizer in the ag world, is soluble in water. Um, depending on what salt you're using, you could have 
two grams per hundred milliliters of water as your solubility constant, or you could have a hundred grams of, of a salt uh, dissolve in a hundred mils of water. Does a nutrient have to be uh, soluble or in liquid form to be absorbed by a plant? In most cases, yes. The ability for a salt to break off into positive and negative components, uh, it's in those components most of the time that they are plant available. In talking about salt here, okay, like, I, like what relationship does that play to just fertilizer in general? Is it good? Is it bad? Is it necessary for uptake? Does it hinder uptake? Like what's, you said, you said, you talked about salt three or four different times there. What's the relationship to salt? In the soil, over millions of years, you have rock formations that will over time erode away and as rainwater mixes in and uh, different bacteria in the soil interact with those rock units and, and, and those rock formations, they will erode themselves away into smaller and smaller and more simple and simple units. Those simple units then become the food that every plant on this planet feeds on. So if you take a salt, uh, it's, it's, it's the result of an acid-base reaction. Okay. So as you put something that's very acidic, you take something like acid rain and you hit a rock with it, you're going to start to erode that away and you're going to get different nutrients that are carved off of that rock formation that integrate into the soil, that get eaten by bugs and peed back into the soup, that in their various forms, in their various simple forms are plant nutrients when they get ionized in water. There's a lot of great takeaways from this conversation. Thanks a lot, David. Uh, today, our guest is Vern Kirk, General Manager for ProGrain. Welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Um, in uh, doing some preparation for this, for this uh, episode, uh, I did some Googling, and I went on to vernonkirk.com, and the Vernon Kirk on VernonKirk.com is an opera singer. So let's let's <laughs> fire let's, one off. Yeah, let's, let's hear it. He he <laughs> those lungs up. Are you a singer, Vern? No, nobody wants to hear me sing at all. No. Uh, so tell us about ProGrain, Vern. Uh, what do you guys do, and what do you stand for? Um, we build uh, grain baggers and all the machinery involved with grain bagging with the extractor and bag roller. And we, what do we stand for? Is uh, we believe we we're striving to to get a durable machine that's dependable, and with that comes the service that we back it up with. Yeah. When I think of Vern and Pro Grain, like, and we have lots of suppliers, our uh, manufacturers, I guess, and uh, that's the one thing I would say is consistent with when I think of you and Pro Grain. Vern is the one guy, not the one guy, but he is. The guy that you think of, like, if I have an issue with this thing, well, you just know Vern's coming out to either look at it or fix it or troubleshoot it or make it make sense. So, yeah, I'd say that aligns with what I think of when I think ProGrain. How long have you been there, Vern? Um, off and on for a number of years because um, I, I used to farm and then come in to weld at off-season. Yeah. But then I went away for winter jobs and uh, have come back here. I think I've been here for about eight years and returning there. All right, but okay. my wife, Michelle, has been there for, she'll kill me for saying this, but she's over f over 32 years. Oh, wow. So yeah. you work there with your wife? Yeah. What are those uh, conversations at the supper table <laughs> look like? <laughs> you guys talk yeah. shop all the time? Uh, yeah, basically it's a long meeting. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we try to keep it out of the house, but it seems to seep in there once in a while, but it, it works well. We're used to working together when we farm together, so, yeah. And uh, so how, were you around in the beginning when Flamin and ProGrain became an item? Yeah, I was in the back welding uh, back, back in the day. Um, yeah, with, I worked for Bill, for, but yeah. I, I wasn't there full time. I was just seasonal. So. Do you remember when that was? Do you remember what year that was? <clears throat> well, I used to work for Bill uh, when I got out of school. So that was back in 83. Mm-hmm. So that was a little bit before the, the baggers, mm -hmm. but, um, 86 is when he started making baggers and we were, 
like I say, seasonally, I, I would come in and help help weld them out. Yeah. So I'm trying to think. I um, I believe Dave Waitman on the Flamin side started mm -hmm. some of that relationship. Is that accurate? Yeah. Dave is uh, part of our R&D back then. Yeah, <laughs> he, yeah. Yeah, because he, he helped us de develop it as the as issues that showed up. Uh, Dave and Bill worked together to, to smooth things out. I mean, they're not real complicated machines, but there are things that work and, and don't with them. Yeah. And that must have been an introductory to green bags as a storage solution in Saskatchewan. When I grew up, yeah. you never saw a green bag. Yeah, I have to be honest. I uh, farmed uh, about two miles from the welding shop yeah. and I thought they were crazy putting grain in plastic and mm -hmm. here I am today. So yeah, yeah. I didn't know why they were even thinking of doing that. But uh, back when Bill started, it was uh, the Clavel feedlot. Yep. Those guys out in Viscount. Yep. <clears throat> they, they got their hands on some feed barley that needed to be stored and they had some silage bags and they wanted to figure out how to put it in that bag. Mm -hmm. So he approached, they came over and talked to Bill and they came up with the first bagger. Because, so Arc Alloy, uh, Inception is a welding shop, That's right? Yeah, that's right. Arc Alloy started with uh, uh, Kirpins back in 1968 to service the two potash mines, uh, mm. Kalonze and Allen locations. So yeah. they were they're right in the middle of those potash mines yeah. for when they were developed. And just general service, general welding, general yeah. fabrication? S fabrication, especially shoots and yeah whatever else the mine needed at the time yeah cool yeah that was a lot of stainless product at that time did you use yeah or? there is there's lots of stuff that's come out of that shop I mean, yeah i mean some some big projects yeah it is actually kind of crazy and i can almost imagine what producer is no different than yourself back in 2005 to 2010 you mean I'm going to put my grain in a bag and it's not going to get any air? What's going to, like, is it going to spoil? Is it going to keep? I mean, you're trusting tens of thousands of dollars of product in that bag. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, a lot of, a common question is what, what's the moisture content or what can I put in the bag? And mm -hmm. we often, like, I, I recommend just treat it like a bin. Would you put, it depends on how long you're going to put it in there yeah. for. How hot is it outside? What, yep. You know, what's the moisture content and so on. There's a lot of variables there. So mm -hmm. um, we've had extremes on on the moisture end, that, but the it worked out that because the producer wanted to put it in there to get the harvest over and take it out right away, throw it through the dryer. Yep. So the list of why people use our product is it, it grows every year. So... Have you seen a steady increase of, um, I would say, the use of baggers over the course of time? The increase, yeah, there's, uh, every year seems to be another reason why to, to use it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot more competi competitors out there now, yeah. where back when we first started, there wasn't anybody else. So um, <clears throat> worldwide, even, like Argentina right now is bagging over half their their produce so uh, hmm. ha half their commodity is in bags and it's it's big down there and they do two crops so so is that something that has increased for argentina or is there a lack of you know galvanized metal there for for bins or it's nothing that they're used to doing or why would that be i um i think it's because it's fast yeah. a fast way to handle a lot of bushels and in it's field. convenient yep and they just don't have the the storage that we do. Yeah. So I'd have to do more research to find out exactly why they're doing it. But. Yeah. Um, let's just go back a little bit and talk a little bit about yourself, Vern. Uh, where did where did you grow up? Um, what was your upbringing like? That sort of thing. Um, I I grew up in Colonze, right where we yeah. we weld right now. Um, I, uh, went to school there from K to twelve. Yeah. And uh, growing up in a small town, Saskatchewan, is, was a blast. I'd recommend it to everybody. <laughs> and that's, that's, why I raised, that's why we raised our children there, too. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a safe, safe place to grow up, and you learn how to work right away. So I think good people come from small places. Your, uh, your family farmed as you were growing up? Yeah. Um, did you go to the farm from school then, or did you uh, do some other things? Yeah, we lived on the farm till I was seven, and oh, then yeah. moved into town, which was yeah two miles. Okay, so it's not a big change. Bike ride. 
Yeah. Yeah. Or yeah, bike, ski, run, whatever it took yeah. to get in and out of town. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but as we got into sports, it was easier to be in town and uh, dad had cattle out there. So we were there every day yeah. back and forth. Yeah. How many kids in your family? Um, in, when I grew up? Yes. Yeah. I had two siblings, two, okay. two brothers. Okay. Older, younger? I'm right in the middle. Who's the toughest out of you three? Oh, definitely me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. F- fondest memories on the farm? Yeah. Wow. Well, um, being around the, uh, I don't know, the animals were fun to, to raise, but uh, I, d- I, I did a lot of go-karting and mm-hmm. some, my friends had dirt bikes, but I didn't have one, so I had to build something to get going. So <laughs> then I got a mini bike and I, I was with them, but I was just there later. <laughs> yeah. we got caught we go-karting down the back roads and uh the rc our rcmp guy put us in the back of his car turned the heat up on high and uh, <laughs> talked to us for way too long and then uh made sure we or threatened us that he was gonna tell our parents before before we did and so you yeah. run home and tell them and yeah nothing came of it other than <laughs> and he and he followed us to to get the yeah. go karts off the road, so we got the drive, police escort. <laughs> <laughs> I guess. <laughs> yeah. Were you in trouble from your parents, or did they laugh? Uh, they just, yeah, they kind of laughed yeah. because where else are you going to drive those? Well, things? exactly. Yeah, but it was. Uh, I guess we were a little bit close to town for and on a busier road, so. But we we had to get to where we were going. I guess. I don't know. Well, when we were. In my family, when we were younger and we had some dirt bikes and you just, you go to your buddy's house across the field and if you didn't know or you didn't pay attention to when seating was, you, uh, you made some pretty nice ruts through the field yeah. that, that, and actually at the time we weren't even aware of, it was more when dad got home from work that night or sometime that week, it's like, Hey, did you guys dirt bike over like past, uh, whatever we called it the bow trail, but whatever. And, uh, like, yeah, Why? He says, well, Uncle Joey just called. Oh, like so? Yeah, you guys, uh, you need to go take a hoe and you need to go fill in those ruts. We're like, come on, are you kidding? <laughs> and then, like, same thing. And as we got older, there was trucks that we used to take from Flamin. And, yeah, we didn't know. But I'm sure back then they would have preferred us to be on the yeah. <laughs> gravel yeah. roads yeah. sort of yeah. cutting up fields. Yeah, exactly. But it, it was, I don't know, we, we had lots of forts. I think that was probably one of the fondest ones is we tree forts and yeah, yeah. Know, outside, being outside all the time is build, it's fun for me. Build stuff. Yeah. What kind of animals did you, did you have? Oh, I just had chickens and cows. Yeah. Nothing, nothing crazy. The nothing. two food groups that you need. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, tell me about uh, some of your overseas travels. You mentioned that you've been to Australia. Um how did you get there? Why'd you go? And uh, what was that experience like? I was working at Lake Louise at the time. Uh, I got chosen to go on their ski instructors exchange. Um, it was a, a great opportunity to go travel and, and work. So it was, uh, yeah, it was, it was very interesting to see how they, how they ski and the Aussies are so much fun to be around. They're pretty similar to Canadians. So where is there a mountain in Australia that must be somewhere oh, I, up in the I was on Mount Buller so that's in the that's north of Melbourne okay yeah so you can actually see Mount Buller there's an old movie uh, man from snowy river yeah yeah and in the back when he rides the horse down the hill Mount Buller is in the background and you can see the ski runs cut out of the trees but, oh really oh cool but I hit a good year with snow and it was it was a great experience so you could yeah, skied with a lot of <clears throat> a lot of great skiers. Though. Never been to Melbourne. Been through Australia, north of there though. But I, I Melbourne's on the bucket list for yeah. sure. It's a, it's a, at that time that was a hundred years ago, so that was a while while ago. <laughs> yeah, and then from there overseas, like I when I was working at Fernie, I had a customer that uh, he's like the king's aide of Saudi Arabia, but he got he hired us uh, to teach his kids how to ski. So. It, he'd take us over to Switzerland. Oh yeah. And so we had 
I've, I've had a colorful past with those guys. They've, they've got way too much money. <laughs> yeah. how Money's many, not their problem. How many baggers have you shipped over to the Middle East? <laughs> I, I would love to ship some <laughs> over there. At least go demo to them. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. Yeah. Those guys are, uh, they're an interesting family. That's for sure. Are you still in contact at all? Uh, not as much anymore at all. The mm -hmm. last time was an Aspen trip with them. And that was, that was quite a while ago. The kids have grown up now and yeah. they're in, they're in the States most yeah. of the time but yeah it's interesting yeah um what about as you transition into uh pro grain uh, how much uh, how long did you farm before you started doing this uh, full time and um what was that experience like well we uh worked on the farm as a kid um on the goon spoon squad there for mm -hmm. as i grew <laughs> up but then um actually farming for myself i farmed for 16 years oh yeah so 07 was my last season of seeding. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I just wasn't the gambler I thought I was. So that's, <laughs> and my dad was looking for retirement. Yeah. Um, so that was time for, for us to change. Yep. But agriculture has always been, been an interest of ours. So you knew you'd be in the industry in somehow. some capacity. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. When did, um, when did sales or uh, representing a product become something that uh, you wanted to pursue? Uh, when, when Bill asked me to join him on a farm show, because <laughs> 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 he said you can talk more <laughs> than I can. So he, um, cause I, in the, in the off season, I worked with the public, so I had no problem talking to, to people. So he thought it was a good idea that I join him on these farm shows and, and I liked it. So, yeah. um, talking about the product but not knowing the numbers really at that point but yeah um it's uh it's been good to work with Flavin I mean they're they've been with this product a long time since day one so yeah it's uh it's been a good relationship there um w where do you feel like the product line is going what's what's the next step with this product line is it bigger bags is it maybe smaller more versatile units is where are we going um I think um I think the what we're seeing right now there's two ways to go there's one is uh you can make it luxurious but in our mind we in the end of the day you're just putting grain in a bag mm -hmm. how much you want to spend doing that can dictate how fancy the machine is mm -hmm. the technology is there to to have to make it very easy to use um in our lineup we we tend to lean more to where We'd rather have more value. It's not a piece of machinery that needs that much luxury. Mm -hmm. In fact, in some of our models, we've cut back on luxury and we found more more interest in durability. Yeah, mm -hmm. because the uh, the combines grew up; they're big. Uh, the grain carts came along, and now they're huge, mm -hmm. and we're next in line. Mm -hmm. So the grain cart dumping into us has to be very dependable. Yeah. Um, Otherwise, you've got multiple combines sitting still because because our our failure. So that's the pressure on us to keep. It has to be simple. It has to be. If it does break, it has to be uh, very easy to fix. Or mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, common bearings help. Mm -hmm. Things like that. Yeah, we we had uh, a representative from AGI on uh, not too long ago, and you know, we similar thing with some of the augers that they're selling. It's the the last line of defense when it yeah. comes to efficiency on the farm, right? So you could have all the combines you want, you can have all the grain carts you want, but if you've got nowhere to go with that grain, you're bottlenecked, right? Yeah. I, it reminds me of a story. This guy came up to me at a farm show and says, can you guarantee this bagger won't break down? And I said, absolutely not. He said, what is your concern? Well, I can't have my combines stopped. I said, well, the other option is to buy a second bagger and just have it sitting standby. Mm -hmm. And he said, that's a good idea. Mm -hmm. And he walked away, and I think that was a very good idea. <laughs> I think he's thinking of it. Yeah. So if you're in that position, I mean, that's the best guarantee I can give you there, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah. You can't guarantee a product. It's, no. It's a man-made machine. Uh, yeah. We've said this on almost every episode, it yeah. seems, is that, yeah, if God made it, it'll die. And if man made it, it'll break. That's yeah. And it's just that <laughs> simple. Like, yeah. yeah. That's yeah. right. So when you're working on, on developing product, what does your, your R and D process look like? Um, we have a, we have a very small R and D program. Um, and what, what we set up is 
two out of three people have to agree to the idea and you must sleep on every idea. So that may sound really super simple, but it's, I have final say if I, what if it goes through, but I don't, I have some ideas, but they're not always right. So if I came up with an idea and then the two and pr presented it to the other two guys sitting on R and D, um, if they both disagreed, then that gets tossed. That idea gets tossed. But most of the time, our ideas come from the farm shows talking to the farmers. They tell you what works and what doesn't and what changes they want. And that's where we get our ideas. So to develop it, um, once we make a change, if it's a drastic change, like if, we're, it's, uh, if it's a product, a brand new product, we need to test it because it's way easier to sell them if you know that it works. Mm -hmm. So we have that saying, and I'm sure other people do too. It's, it's tough and then it needs to be farmer tough. It's, mm -hmm. and then as you guys know, it needs to be rental tough. Yeah. So I like the, I like the idea of sleeping on an idea. Oh yeah. Cause I mean, you get around a table and there, you come up with some grand scheme two o'clock in the yeah. morning and that's a great idea and you wake up the next morning I'm like what was i thinking like that <laughs> yeah <we've laughs> or you talk to your wife i'm like uh-uh <laughs> yeah it's yeah. like you've been in the meetings <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. my mom used to always say try it on I was like well, what do you mean no i legitimately disagree with you right now yeah but i'm not asking you to agree or disagree just try it on and we'll talk tomorrow like, and then and it's funny how things could come full circle in 24 hours. Like, you know what? I thought about that. It's actually not so stupid or you're all in. And then the next day it's like, no nope, awful idea. And it was maybe one of those 2 a.m. conversations <laughs> that it was a great idea <laughs> then. But yeah, I, I think we've always if we have a it might be a good idea today. And after sleeping on it, it's even a better idea tomorrow. And it's a, we've already started refining it. Mm -hmm. And some of the ideas um we, we've learned over over our time there not to rush it mm -hmm. because it's something better is going to happen all the time my our, our draftsman as might not agree because some of the changes we make are uh, like it's continuous so he's busy and behind so <laughs> he's got to hurry up here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah as as such a simple machine and it's small changes are making the difference right now um What's what's the one piece of advice you'd give to someone um, starting out in a position similar to yours, representing a product, um, you know, dealing with suppliers and obviously dealing with the the end use customer? Uh, patience, <laughs> <I guess. laughs> um, because you're, uh, you know, just because you explained it to somebody five minutes ago, it doesn't mean the guy on the phone right now heard that conversation. So mm -hmm. you got to be able to switch your brain from one yep. to the other pretty quick. Yeah. Yeah. So it's dealing with uh um i like like today's technology with telephone has saved service time mm -hmm. immensely because it's not the doom of flicky on the end of that thing it's uh, uh send me a picture yeah and that, yeah. that just saves time or facetime yeah well you're by the right bag, there let's see it yeah. yeah and that that's helping a lot because yeah. that takes away the the time that it people get angry and frustrated and so on like so I, I don't mind the, that part of it. If somebody was, if, I don't know, you, you're you not supposed to have too many hats on when you're to run efficiently, but in right now I have got a lot of hats. So yeah. I got a lot, a lot of good people that can help me out do, in every aspect, but it, my day has a lot of different avenues in it. Which is your favorite hat? What do you like most? I like sales. I, I like sales and s talking to the people. I yeah. mean, that's, that to me is is uh it's very s satisfactory when s somebody uses your product and it works for them mm -hmm. that's that's pr feels pretty good if you can feel like you're helping them out do what you know feed the world i mean that's that's yeah. what agriculture is all about so we're, we're pretty s happy doing our part in that has customer expectations changed since you've started your career um no, because we always think, what if I'm that customer? Yeah. So mm -hmm. you want value. You want it dependable. People will pay more for dependability, I think, than uh, 
then if it doesn't work, they don't really care how much money they they saved on it or whatever, but because it let them down. So yeah. it has to work. You're losing a lot of money when the combines are shut down. That's right. Yeah. Do you remember your least favorite day doing what you're doing? Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was on a... Uh, <laughs> I wouldn't, I don't know. It's hard to say it. I think we did a, uh, a demo yeah. for you guys. Yeah. Um, was with an extractor and this was my early days helping Bill with sales and so on. And three of us went out there and we show up and the bag is destroyed by deer. There's a foot of rotten grain on the bottom. <laughs> it's going to be a challenge and you've got people standing around and to show your machine off well we couldn't get it to feed properly and so on well i was low man on the totem pole so i'm in there digging the rotten grain out and oh. thinking back on <laughs> your decision yeah, yeah. my decision because i'm right back to step one of when i was young at the farm digging yeah. the rotten grain at yeah. the bottom of the bin yeah. so yeah i haven't really excelled here too much <laughs> <Yeah>. so <laughs> That's kind of, it's not, the, I guess it's not the worst day and it was cold and windy and yeah. nobody really wanted to be there. So did it, you make the sale? Well, we're still selling them today. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So let's, uh, let's do uh, some, some rapid fire questions. So we'll just, um, we'll ask you the question and then just off the top of your head, don't put any deep thought into it. Just need your answer. Okay. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Uh, if you could try one occupation other than your own what would it be teacher uh you won the lottery tomorrow um a couple million bucks in your bank account what's your first purchase new fishing boat oh, that's i was gonna say hunting or fishing <laughs> <laughs> I didn't, already it, answered yeah unless you said uh a new hunting truck a which new, a new fishing boat to hunt moose out of I'm yeah going, oh. yeah Okay, yeah. pass. <laughs> <laughs> Mitch, it would be fishing. Yeah. yeah. What time of the day do you get your best work done? Not most, but best. Mid-morning. Um, hot dogs or burgers? Burger. Is a hot dog a sandwich? No. I think we're split about 50-50. Uh, yeah. yeah. Really yeah. <laughs> uh, muscle cars or sports? Muscle car. Yeah. What's one thing that almost everybody disagrees with you about? That I'm a good singer. <laughs> <laughs> Pepsi or Coke? Coke. Summer or winter? Winter. Brown liquor or beer? Well, can't we have both? <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> but but <laughs> yeah, I would go, it would be beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you could start uh, any business, what would it be? Any any business. Uh, yeah, teaching young people to be farm operators. Nice. You know, and neat you say that because there is probably a bit of a market for that. Not like a bit. Like there's, I just think of some of the sales guys that we have here that either came from the farm or stopped farming or their family stopped farming when they were young. So then we have equipment and there's a legitimate desire for them to, they want to go be experts on it. Like they yeah. don't want to just sell it. So what we do, I'm actually in the process of doing this right now, is we set up, it's almost like a demo day, but it's it's more so a hands-on, it's a training day. Like we don't invite customers. We get our sales guys to go run equipment. It doesn't matter if it's augers or a grain dryer or a bagger or an extractor because, and you've been there, when a customer phones you and it's like this POS is piled up and blah, blah, blah. And so, so who do they phone? They phone their sales rep who tries to be the equipment expert. But if they don't have the reps or the hours logged on it, they're really not that confident in, you know, what the fix is. So I think you're on to something. Vern, when you're, yeah. when you're done and you're <laughs> retired, you can take all your farming <laughs> wisdom and we'll start, we'll start a side hustle. Yeah. Sias actually does have a, a course in uh, their Moose Jaw campus where they are doing just that. Really? Yeah. So, I mean, this all stems from the fact that if we want to keep the ag industry growing and healthy, yep. we need to rely on uh, urban kids to see agriculture as a legitimate uh, employment opportunity, not right. just rural, yep. right? Because we're running out of kids. So yep. they recognize that and they're providing a avenue for that. 
Mexico or Arizona? Well, I would say Mexico because I've never been to Arizona. Okay. Well, the, I'll just say the desert in general. But that's it doesn't matter if it's Arizona or Palm Springs. It'd be the same. You're a beach guy. I would. Yeah, I've been on a lot of beaches, but uh, Mexico or Cuba, I would go Cuba. Oh yeah. Yeah. From a beach standpoint. From a beach. Or, well, yeah. To watch or play. Uh, give me one of each. Ski, downhill skiing to, to do, uh, hockey to watch. Favorite meal? Steak. Favorite Taylor Swift song? <laughs> that is a question there, that Mitch has asked. Yeah, uh, it's, uh, yeah. yeah sure. it's <laughs> the one that she complains about her boyfriend. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there one. you go. That's, he's got an answer. Yeah. Yeah. There's, no doubt. there's lots of times where I get looked at like... Yeah. What company am Top I interviewing notch. for? And it just Top makes notch. me so happy. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more of a Avril Lavigne fan. Did you see her when she was live in Saskatoon? Uh, I have seen her live, but my kids have grown up now, so it's oh, kind of yeah. hard for me to walk in there now. Yeah, it gets a little, <laughs> bit, gets a little weird. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Cats or dogs? Dogs. So anyone listening out there that's applying to FAM and just uh, think about this one, but... <laughs> If you were a pizza topping, Vern, which one would you be and why? Cheese, you're all over everything. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I think one of my uh, one of my favorite answers to that was, um, and like you can come up with any reason behind it, but she said she's like pepperoni because I'm there but I can be a little bit spicy. And I was like, oh, I don't know now. I'm like, now I'm the one that's confused after the answer. Like, yeah. like did I just get interviewed here? <laughs> awesome. So is there, there anything else that you want us to know about, about being Vern? About being Vern. <laughs> yeah. don't, don't do it. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I mean, um, I still enjoy meeting people and uh agriculture people are are people involved with agriculture i think are still a, a great hearty good bunch of people so i enjoy what we're doing and uh it's easy to get up in the morning and do what i do that's for sure all right good well thanks for joining us today Vern. yeah that was fun thanks you guys thank you for listening to flam and connect for Mitch Flamin and Regan Kuntz, I'm Trevor Grindy. Join us next time. Talk to you soon.